Welcome everyone. Um, it's so great to have so many of you here in the evening. Um, so we appreciate you taking the time to spend with us this evening. Now, um, a few, I'm going to pull up my slides. And just wanted to mention, I recognize some of your names from having attended um, past live sessions that we've done. Some of you, this may be your first uh, live session for this month long event, but I just wanted to mention that we're in the middle of the fourth week of VSAC's College and Career Pathways events. Uh, it's the entire month of March and there's been, I think nearly 40 live sessions. There's still 10 more coming up because uh, the event continues into next week. So all of the past events have been recorded and are available on VSAC's event website. So if there's anything you're interested in seeing that you missed, you can go ahead and take a look at that. And um, also we have um, more resources on that website. So you'll see that there's things like um, guided questions with video clips that you can do with your student or take a look at at yourself to see what resources are there. So there's a lot, a lot there. I wanted to just take a moment to introduce our staff who's here tonight. So along with myself is Lauren Duran, our program manager, and she'll be in the chat posting links to resources that I will mention. And also she can keep an eye on any questions that come up. Now, if you have a burning question that we're not able to answer tonight, just because we either run out of time or we don't have the exact answer at our fingertips, um, you can get in touch with us. I'll have um, Lauren share our web address and it's info at careersclick.org if you want to email us to ask that question and we can follow up with you. But feel free to ask questions via the chat. We'll do our best to answer them tonight as we go. I wanted to give you just a little background on our organization in case you haven't heard of Careers Click. Uh, we have programming for grades K through 12 that follows a continuum of career development. So starting in elementary school, career awareness. Um, if you think back to when you were in elementary school, you re might remember things like dress up um, and thinking about what you wanted to be when you grew up and things like doctors, nurses, firefighter, police officer, um, that really early awareness of what jobs are, um, including teaching um, that teachers are working. A lot of times elementary school students that needs to be pointed out to them. And career exploration begins in middle school. That's when students actually start taking a look at their interests and exploring different options all the way through to high school career preparation, which is a lot of the events that have been happening throughout this month. And when I use the word career, um, it really involves everything that goes along with a career, which inc would include post-secondary education and training. Uh, so we don't focus particularly on college access and college admissions and college applications and the college search. Um, but when we talk to youth about careers, we do incorporate information on what kind of education and training is needed for those careers. So for us, college and um, training, things like that are included when we talk about careers. Lauren um, will share in the chat a link to our website so that you can go and see if you want to learn anything more about our programs. And just to give you an example of our reach, we've been a nonprofit organization since 1998. We've served over 20,000 students. We've worked with almost 1,500 employers. Uh, we've done professional development for over 700 teachers and almost reached 200 schools in both New Hampshire and Vermont. So tonight's session is part, is a the last installment of a four part series. The first was the first week in March. We had identifying your career interests for students. And on March tenth, we had showcasing essential skills for students. On March seventeenth, we had navigating your own career path for students. And Lauren is sharing the links to the recording of those in case you want to see them. Those, I know, uh, I, I recognize a few names here, so I know a few parents and guardians might have attended some of those sessions. They were really geared towards students, but if you were curious about any of the information we shared with students, because you're here tonight, and curious about um, some information on supporting your teen's career search, there's a lot of good information in those sessions, so feel free to watch those if you haven't already. 
And then here we are tonight with supporting your teen's career search. This is a special session for parents and guardians. Um, if there are students here, I saw there were a couple, that's great. Um, so we, our staff has spent the last month um, asking around, asking experts, asking students themselves, asking educators, um, career professionals, college admissions counselors about what advice would you give to parents about supporting their teen's career search. So tonight is a culmination of all of that information we've collected in addition to um, some of the content that we share with students when we're working with youth. So there's a lot of fresh information that we've gathered over the last month and then plus um, 23 years worth of experiences from the programming that we've done with youth. Okay, we're gonna do, oh, I guess Anna's poll earlier about your role was actually our warm up poll. So you should already be warmed up with taking a poll, but um, I have some different questions. I want to get a pulse on um, where you're at with talking with your teen about career planning. Now, there are no wrong answers and your responses are anonymous. Um, we'll share the aggregate results, but we won't know who answered what. So please just feel comfortable and be honest. Um, we just wanna get an idea of how often you talk about career planning with your teen. Is it frequently, is it occasionally or rarely? And remember, any answer is okay. And um, as Anna pops up this poll, um, we also realize that depending on where your teen is at, if they're at the beginning of high school or the end of high school, you might be having um, different frequency of those conversations. So it's um, just helpful for us to get a picture of tonight's audience. So we'll give you just a little more time to answer that. Looks like we have about 80% of you have responded so far. And if I think if you're a student attending alone without a parent or guardian, you can go ahead and answer this question from your perspective of how often you talk um, with your parent or guardian about career planning. Okay, looks like we got a couple more. So I think that's good. We'll end that poll and share the results. I am gonna read them aloud because these recordings don't capture the image of the poll results. So 42% of you said frequently, that's great. 47% of you said occasionally and 11% of you said rarely. So I'm hoping after tonight sharing this information that maybe the frequency of those conversations will increase um, because it's just a really good conversation to have and they don't necessarily need to be family meeting style, um, which both of my kids dread when we, we use that phrase, um, they can be short little conversations like on a ride to school or a ride to the grocery store or to a practice. Um, they can be five minute conversations or they can be longer conversations that might be actually sitting down and tackling a question or doing something um, to help with career planning. So any kind of conversation long or short, big or small, is helpful for career planning. I did want to say that Cruise Click, in all of the programming that we do, we um, survey students at the end of our programs, and we ask them all sorts of questions about how the program went for them. One of the questions that we ask is, how often do adults talk to you about your career interests? So we actually have many years worth of data. So we were poking around and looking at that data in preparation for tonight. And we found that on average, about a third of the students respond that adults talk to them frequently or often about their career interests. And about two thirds say sometimes or hardly ever. And that, for, that question is phrased for all adults. So it could be a school counselor, a mentor, a coach, um, a parent or guardian, any of the above, another family member, a grandparent, aunt or uncle. Um, so that tells us that probably for youth, um, increasing the frequency of those conversations could be helpful. Now I have two teenagers myself, so I know sometimes it's hard to say, let's talk about this important topic, um, but just keep in mind that they can be really small conversations. 
Okay, so we're going to start out with interests and aspirations. And to do that, we're going to go back. So think of the way back machine, we're going to do some time travel. And um, when we work with employers a lot who host youth in their workplaces for maybe job shadows, workplace tours, or internships, um, maybe they do career mentoring. Um, we do a lot of trainings for employers who work with youth. And the first thing that we do is say, let's go back to when you were in middle school, if you're hosting an eighth grader on job shadow day, or let's go back to when you were in high school, if you're going to be hosting an intern um, from high school because it can be really helpful for adults to put ourselves in the mindset of when we were youth. Um, setting generational differences aside, um, there are some developmental aspects when it comes to talking about career development that are timeless. Um, and so it just helps to put yourself back in that mindset of what was I thinking about in high school? So I wanna find out from you. We don't have a poll for this because this is not um, multiple choice or yes, no. I would love to hear from some of you in the chat what your career aspirations were when you were in high school. So back to when you were, let's say, 16. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? Or what did you, what were you starting to set your sights on for doing after high school? What were those career aspirations? And if you take a moment to share in the chat, I'm hoping a few of you will, um, what is your career now? Um, so Jen, I see you're saying a, a veterinarian. So I'd be curious if you can share with others what your career is now. And Sarah, a career in the medical field, if you'd be willing to let us know what your career field is now. So Jen's an outreach coordinator at a tech center, not a veterinarian. Um, Jen, Oh, we have, we have more than one Jen. So we have a Jennifer said, I wanted to be an accountant, um, but now, oh, okay. So, so let's see, I'm trying to match up my people here because they're come, the chats are coming in separately. So it looks like Jen is in econ now. Um, Sarah is with Circus Mercus. Sarah, you did a teacher workshop that I attended probably almost 20 years ago on circus arts in the classroom. Um, so, okay, so this is great. So we're hearing, um, oh, here's one that's together in one chat. So this is helpful for me. Anna wanted to be an immigration lawyer and is now an events planner. And I would say events planner extraordinaire. She's one of the best that I've ever encountered. Um, and Amanda said wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer and career as a lawyer. So this is fantastic. So just thinking back to high school, when I was in high school, I had all different interests at different stages, but my last career interest in high school that I actually went to college for is I wanted to be in advertising. So I got a degree in marketing and today I am working in a nonprofit. I had no idea in high school that you could earn a living working for a nonprofit. I had done a lot of volunteering and I thought you could only volunteer your time for no pay with nonprofits. I didn't realize that you could work in human services and help people and earn a living. So there's more and more and more streaming in. Thank you for sharing. And um, all of you might be able to follow these better than I can, but I see Jeff says, wanted to be a journalist, now a software engineer. So these are all phenomenal examples of just bringing yourself back to high school, remembering what you wanted to do and what your aspirations are and what you are now. Having that story to tell about your path can be really helpful when interacting with youth about what they are thinking about in high school because what they want to be in high school might not be what they end up doing for a career. It might, um, but it's just helpful to have that mindset when you're supporting your youth in their career search. So this is something we share with students that a lot of times people think success, which <clears throat> we also talk to youth about all the different definitions for success that each person has their own definition and at different stages of your life, that definition can change. So um, maybe money is really important to you. Maybe um, image is really important to you. Maybe climbing a corporate ladder is important to you. Um, maybe family time and free time and hobbies and special interests are important to you. So depending on what your definition of success is at different stages of your life, 
Um, that can vary by person. So we like to tell youth that a lot because a lot of times they hear, you need to do this in order to be successful, or it's really important to be successful. Well, you first have to define success for you where you're at now and start trying to make predictions of how that might change over time. So we talk to youth about rarely is the path to success linear. Rarely does it follow a straight line. Um, so instead, usually that path is full of twists and turns. Now, I only asked you two questions. What did you um, aspire to when you were in high school? And what are you now? I didn't ask you how many times did that change along the way? Um, did you change? Did you go to college and change your major several times? Um, did you try something right out of school and then change right away? Or did you do that for a while and then make a change? So sometimes those aspirations, those interests can change early on many times, and then those jobs can change. And so something else that we tell teenagers, and this is all helpful for you to just be able to talk about with your youth, um, some of this, these curves on this path to success, there's data behind it. Um, every time they take a study on how many times people change their jobs, it increases a little bit. And right now, um, that average time of changing jobs is 12. So we know that there's going to be lots of twists and turns in that path because the average person is changing their jobs 12 times. That means that there are people changing their jobs more than that. And of course, less than that, because that's the average. Um, but that's a lot of changes. Um, and that study comes from um, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, where they have a list of many reasons why. Seeking higher pay, better benefits and perks, relocation, career advancement, uh, choosing a less stressful job, changing career focus, better work-life balance, reorganization at their company. It wasn't their choice. They were looking for more interesting work, better work schedule. Their skills and abilities didn't fit the job. We actually hear that a lot when we're talking to adults. Um, and a better alignment between personal values and organizational priorities. That's another reason. So if youth, when they're embarking on their career path planning, can understand that each person has their own definition of success, that definition can change over time based on your station in life. And then even once you launch your career, it's probably going to change quite a bit. That can be really helpful information that can do a few things. It can set realistic expectations and it can also take off some of the pressure to have everything figured out and to um, keep following a linear path. That's not necessarily the only path to success. So that can be helpful when working with youth. Uh, I was talking to my daughter over FaceTime last night. She's a freshman at college. And I said, Rose, I'm doing a workshop tomorrow for parents and guardians and, and other adults who support youth and their career path planning. What advice would you have? Um, of course, she has a mom who works in career development, but both of my kids are super sensitive to that and they don't like getting all of their advice from mom since this is my, my field of work. Um, so they actually look to a lot of other adults for advice. Um, but my daughter said, be sure to let your kids know that they don't have to have it all figured out by the end of high school. So this is a college freshman, second semester in a pandemic, and that's her advice. She said paths will shift as they learn more and gain experience and new opportunities can come up when you weren't expecting it. Um, so that's advice from, from a college freshman. Okay, so um, for interests, we like to recommend to youth as they're identifying their interests to consider taking one or more career interest surveys. Um, I'm going to ask Lauren to put a link to uh, an example of a career interest survey. I don't know if you yourself have ever filled out any kind of career interest survey anywhere along your career path. Um, there are some that are geared just for adults um, who are maybe making career changes. And um, you maybe you did one in high school that you remember, remember or in college. Now, some youth have really good access to career interest surveys in school. If they go to a career and technical education center, they likely have access to really great resources like this. But even in a high school in Vermont, if they have a personalized learning plan, which is referred to as a PLP, 
a lot of times those platforms have um, built in interest surveys that students can take. So sometimes I know there's one platform that has one in seventh grade and another one in ninth grade. It can be really helpful for students to take them every other year because they're changing so frequently because they're growing so much. So taking more than one is really good. And we even recommend taking more than one type or one style because you could take two career interest surveys side by side on the same day um, from two different makers and you could come up with slightly different results. Um, and then we know for youth, they could take the same survey three months apart and come up with different responses just because three months is a long time when you're a teenager and your interests can change. So um, that can be a fun activity that you can do together. Um, I do career interest surveys every few months just to test them out before using them with youth, but I do them for real. Like I really think, what am I interested in? And I love to see that I still have remnants of my past interests that come up in the results, um, but really strong leanings towards what I'm doing today because I like my job and I'm still interested in it. Um, sometimes as an adult, if you fill one out, you, if you're not in love with the work that you do, you might find that your results are really far away from what you're doing. Um, so it can be kind of fun to do it with your teen. So we actually recommend adults print one out for yourself, or if it's online, do it online, um, with your teen side by side, you can learn a lot about each other as you do it. And it can help you kind of get in to your teen's mind about what they're thinking about with interests if you do the survey yourself too. So not required optional activity, but it can be fun and enlightening for you. So this particular survey, which Lauren shared the link to. Um, I'm going to ask her to share another link to the same source. It's um, Advanced CTE. They have the 16 career clusters, which is something that we use with youth um, all the time, not just in tech centers or in tech ed, but really general ed. And it's really important for youth to see that there are a lot of occupations out there, but they're organized in all sorts of helpful ways that can be by um, career interests, by personality type, um, all different things. So career clusters, just for the nutshell version, are 16 groupings of careers that share similarities. They share similar knowledge, um, abilities, skills, and pathways towards those careers. So if youth can take hundreds of occupations and see them group together in 16 groupings, it can make it a little easier to focus in on um, their own interests than just getting an alphabetical list of hundreds of occupations. So it's a helpful way to group them. And this particular survey that we shared the link to here actually points students to what career clusters they might be interested in, not what specific occupation you'd be interested in. So it's really up to the student to do the survey, learn more about those career clusters, and then um, explore those career clusters to find occupations they might be interested in, which is a really good way for beginner career planning um, to do it that way. But there's all sorts of other resources out there. And if you were to just search on the internet career interest survey, you'll find all different types. This is just an easy one to access and it's free um, and pretty doable. You don't need a trained or licensed person to lead it. Okay, so after um, identifying interests, we talk a lot with youth about essential skills. So um, that's a term we like to use. All different organizations and agencies use different terms. There might be things like foundational skills, critical skills, transferable skills. The state of Vermont um, Agency of Education uses the term transferable skills. And we say essential because they're so important. And the agency of education says transferable because they also can apply to many, if not most um, jobs. So we talk to youth about when you're in high school, um, if there's one thing you can do skill-wise, it's to gain as many of these transferable skills as you can, because then it keeps your options open for after high school. And no matter what education or training or work path you head down, you will have these skills that can apply to all of those things. So um, that's our goal as an organization is to make sure that students have access to identifying and 
um, learning and gaining those skills and being able to talk about it um, so they can tell people what skills they have and, and demonstrate those. And then once they pick their career interest and they get on that path, they can learn more job specific or career specific skills um, in whatever recommended way there is through education and training and experience. So let's go way back again. And could you just share it in the chat? Um, think back to your first job, like your first paid job. Um, is there a skill that you learned on that job that you still learn today? And I have actually asked this question for many years when I do employer training and I tally up these responses and I share them with youth. I'm like, this is what adults say. They learned these skills on their very first job and they're still using them today. So it's a really good illustration of um, early skills attainment, how they, those skills can have lasting benefits. So um, Lauren, if you have time to lean, you have time to clean. I know you got that from an ice cream shop, right? I have said that so many times after I heard that from you. Nancy said typing. Um, Jen said customer service from waitressing. Excellent. Jane says dealing with people as a waitress. Um, lots of skills there. Sarah says learning how to give back change with no calculator um, or register helping you. So that's... That's a great skill. So um, be thinking about that multitasking as a waitress. So it's helpful for you to understand that these first jobs that may seem like not necessarily a part of their career goals can help them with building skills that will help them with their career goals. Even if that exact job they're in isn't necessarily a part of their career aspirations, they're already building those essential skills. Amanda said to be nice and support coworkers. So great. Um, so my second part to this question is as an adult, what is something you wish you had learned sooner? So maybe a skill or, um, a concept, anything that, you know, is something that you maybe learn the hard way as an adult in your career that you wish that you had learned sooner. And when we ask this question, we take these responses and we share it with educators. Um, so Nancy says, how to hold your tongue when you don't agree. Um, Jeff says, financial planning. Excellent. We hear that a lot. Jen says, how to deal with difficult people. That's not necessarily something, um, that might be readily taught, but so important and such a good skill to have, but sometimes maybe something you have to learn over time with experience. Um, Anne says to advocate for myself. That's excellent. Uh, Anna says to save for retirement right away. Um, that's a tough one to um, impart on young people. It's really hard to start thinking about your retirement when you're just embarking on your career. But boy, if you can learn that early and do that, it pays off. Sarah says to communicate when things are bothering you. Great. Anita, how to estimate the time needed to do a task. Oh, that's a good one. I haven't heard um, that one, but how helpful for time management. We talk a lot with youth about time management because that's definitely an essential skill, but I like the way you phrased that. Okay. And feel free to keep things coming in the chat. We actually get a copy of this chat after. And even though our purpose right now is to be talking with you and helping you, uh, we take all of this information and use it to help others too. So go ahead and keep those coming while we move on. Oh, so uh, a national benchmark for essential skills that we use are the four C's. I don't know if you've ever heard of these, but can you help me in the chat by trying to guess what these are? This is what we have students do this. So if you attended our essential skills workshop for students. So I love it when um, communication comes up first because that's first on my slide. Um, so we have three more. Oh, great. Wow. Like in order, collaboration is the second one. So thanks, Sarah and Catherine. Um, now the next one is one that I just love that it's one of the essential skills, um, because it's maybe not necessarily something that you think of right away when you think of a job and earning money, but these four C's were developed by teams of national educational leaders and employer leaders. So these are business leaders and educators saying, these are the four categories 
of the most essential skills that all students should have by the time they graduate high school, at least a start on building the basic proficiencies for these skills. So the third one, um, if you didn't see it in this list of four C's, you might associate it with people who are artistic, um, maybe people who think differently or out of the box, um, people who can look at, there you go. So Sarah, I'm thinking that circus arts is a really great way to teach students about creativity in the high school, in high school, and then they can use those skills um, on their career path and in different jobs. So the last one um, is something that schools are actually um, really good at, um, but youth can have, a, this is, it's actually two word. Um, the first word starts with a C, but there's two words for this one. Schools are pretty good at teaching this, but what we have learned is that students aren't that great at articulating the skills, even when they have them. Um, so this can be maybe how you look at a problem or a situation and what you do to um, figure it out or solve it. So thank you, Jennifer, critical thinking. So that's our four C's. Those are the four categories. Now, you as a parent or guardian or another adult working with youth, if you can help your teen identify what skills in these four C's they already have, and I even go one step further from identifying, but maybe documenting it. Personal learning plans in schools have places to document skills gained. Um, and of course, academic skills are documented in, you know, taking tests and transcripts, but not always the transferable skills or these four C's are documented in school um, because it can help students realize where they have strengths and where they have gaps and things they want to work on. Maybe they can be thinking about how proficient they are at something and what they want to be more proficient at or what they feel like they're pretty good at. So it's time to focus on something else. Um, so identifying and documenting those skills they already have and then helping your teen articulate, be able to speak about it. One thing that has happened to us, um, we used to work directly with student interns many years ago when we were piloting an internship program. And I remember sitting down with some of those students and saying, all right, let's write your first resume. Um, what skills do you have or what experience do you have? And sometimes those teens would say, oh, I don't have any, I don't have any skills. I haven't really worked in many jobs. And once we would dig in further and find out that they had a paper route or they did babysitting, or I remember with this one teenager ran a cash register at an apple orchard every fall, but I don't have any skills. Um, so it's really hard for teens to realize the skills they're already building and that they have and be able to talk about it, not across the board. Some teens are great at doing that. Um, but if your teen, if you think maybe they're not so good at doing that, make sure you can help give them a boost and identifying the skills that they already have, because trust me, they have many. When we did our skills workshop for teens a couple of weeks ago, we had a poll at the beginning that asked them how many skills they had. And we had the exact same poll at the end. In 45 minutes, their number of skills went up, not because I taught them any skills. They couldn't practice skills in a 45 minute Zoom. It was just because they learned the language around the skills to be able to identify it and talk about it. So that's all it took was 45 minutes um, and their number of skills went up. So it's pretty phenomenal to realize that you can just spend a little bit of time and help with these things. And then the third thing, identifying, um, articulating. And the third thing is gaining new skills, helping your teen find opportunities for building new skills. And there are so many ways to do that. They're building a lot of new sc skills in school. Um, so schools are, of course, a great place, but extracurricular activities, sports, special interests, hobbies, um, youth groups, theater, drama, music, think of all those different things, but also hobbies and interests. Um, if you can find ways to take activities your teen is already interested in and you can turn them into opportunities for building skills that is like a win 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 um, so an example i like to use is um, creating content for a youtube channel 
So if you have a teen in your household, like I do, who likes YouTube and has several channels and they're all special interests um, in my household, it's speed cubing and um, baking and trick shots, <laughs> um, things like that and different kinds of cinematography. So four different channels in our house. Now, someone might say, you know, that's a lot of time spent on YouTube. Um, why doesn't your team do anything productive? Well, we have a pretty easy answer in our house is that our team, teen, is not just consuming content. Our teen is actually creating content and they are learning how all sorts of communication skills. He's doing voiceover narration. He's writing scripts. Um, he's communicating via keywords and search functions with his viewers and his subscribers. Um, he's learning how to write really good descriptions that tell people what things are. He's, you know, he started these when he was 13. So those are skills at 13 that are really helpful. Um, collaboration, two of his channels, he collaborates with others on. They have someone running the camera, someone doing editing, someone coming up with the content and ideas. Creativity is boundless um, with creating YouTube content. You have to be really creative of how to create things that people will be interested in and um, will set you apart from whatever content, what other content is out there. And critical thinking, there are problems galore. There's technical glitches. There's things you have to learn for the first time. Um, we, we have all of the, the agreements with YouTube. We had, our son had to read through everything and figure out ways to work within them with limits for being um, a minor. So all sorts of opportunities for skills with one special interest hobby. So be thinking about that with the teens in your household of what kinds of special interests, hobbies, things they're into, how can those be turned into skills building opportunities? Um, so be on the lookout for that. There's lots of great, great content there. I also wanted to mention, I mentioned earlier that the Vermont Agency of Education uses the term transferable skills. I just wanted to share these with you because in addition to graduation requirements around math, science, social studies, language arts, there's also graduation requirements around transferable skills, which is pretty fascinating. Um, Vermont was actually a really early state to incorporate this into their graduation requirements. Some of them are familiar to the four C's, but there's actually five and there's a couple twists here. So clear and effective communication sounds familiar. Self-direction, this is one that's really wonderful that they've added this here because we know from employers and college admissions professionals that um, self-direction is a big skill they like to see in um, entry-level workers and students coming into college. Creative and practical problem solving, responsible and involves citizenship and informed and integrative thinking. If you wanted to learn more about that, you could search for transferable skills on the Agency of Education's website. Um, it's mostly geared towards educators. There's example scoring criteria and how to help students with building those skills and how to determine um, where they're at with proficiency on that before they graduate. Um, so it's a lot of education speak, but um, if you have a background in education or you're just curious, um, it's definitely fun to poke around there and look at that. Okay, so for career options. Now, if you um, sat in on our navigating your career path, or actually it was in our... Um, we did it in the career interests session for students. We talked about how many occupations there are. And you heard me say earlier when we talked about career clusters as a nice way to condense hundreds of occupations into six categories. Um, we just like to let students know how many occupations there are. So in the United States, does anyone wanna take a guess how many occupations there are? This is individual classifiable, occupations. This isn't how many people are working in those occupations, but just how many occupations there are. Anyone want to guess? And if you were on the session and you heard, go ahead and say the answer. This is kind of like a pop quiz then. Um, any guesses at how many occupations there are in the U.S.? In the chat, if you want to try that out. And if you're not a parent or guardian and you're a college or career access professional, you're welcome to try guessing too.
Okay, anyone? Any takers? Woo! Okay, 700,000. So it's a lot less than that. That's okay. Um, we'll get us closer to the ballpark. 12,000 is closer, but it's a lot less than that. So these are individual um, occupations that have their codable. So I'm going to go ahead and show you this and we'll see how you are at um, guessing our next figure. So there's 923 occupations. This is the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I believe this is for 2020. Um, so this is last year. And the number actually fluctuates um, because jobs actually come and go. Um, there's new jobs that are created. And sometimes there are occupations that go away just because they become obsolete um, or replaced by something else. So 923 is actually a high over the last 20 years, um, but it does go down sometimes. So right now we're at 923. Now, every state keeps track of their own information and that US figure is combined for every occupation, but not every state has every occupation because states can have differences that would make them not have an occupation another state does. So how about a guess for Vermont? And your clue is it has to be less than 923. But when I first learned the statistic, when I moved to Vermont and started working with teens, I was pretty surprised there were this many. And again, it does go up and down. So we have 617, 450, we're coming right between there. It's 567. So these are individual occupations. So when we talked about those 16 career clusters, those are national, those 923 occupations are divided up in those 16 career clusters. So it's really a lot of occupations. And a lot of the youth that we work with in Vermont really have no idea that there's 567 occupations here. So sometimes we'll hear things like, oh, that isn't in Vermont. I'll need to move somewhere else if I want to do that. So we have amazing labor market information specialists in Vermont. We have two at the Vermont Department of Labor. They're federal positions, um, but they're housed here in every state. And they can tell youth all about um, the occupations. Lauren is mentioning maybe that will increase with remote work. That's really an interesting thought. I don't know how the LMI information would go with um, remote work, if it's counted, if it's an occupation that someone's doing from Vermont, but it's from somewhere else. So yeah, so that'll be an interesting twist. So for helping your teen, um, helping them with explore um, explore their options. So encourage your teen to explore options related to their interests. There's all different ways to do that. They can do online research. They could do an informational inf in interview. That's simply just asking someone working in a career they're interested in questions about that career. Um, so that's very easy to do. That can be done in 30 to 45 minutes. They can do many informational interviews to, to do research. Workplace tours, a lot of those are virtual right now. Hopefully those will be coming back to in-person soon. Job shadows, that's actually spending some time observing someone in the workplace. It's really good to start job shadows early and hopefully have a chance to do more than one. And internships, that's a pretty intensive way to explore an option, but a really good thing to encourage your teen to consider. Every high school in Vermont needs to offer um, opportunities for what they call work-based learning. And that's most often in the form of an internship. Um, at tech centers, um, they, they've been called co-ops, um, but also job shadowing can be part of work-based learning. So um, there's all those different ways to explore. And helping your teen understand the skills, education, and training required for various career interests. That link that Lauren shared earlier to um, careertech.org that had the career clusters, not the survey, but the second link, that one, each career cluster that you click on, it gives you all the skills, education, and training required for those career clusters. So you can kind of dig into it and they actually break it down further into more specific categories for sets of careers. Another great resource that we have here in Vermont, we have the McClure Foundation partners with the Vermont Department of Labor, and they publish a guide to, um, it's called Pathways to Promising Careers. It's the highest paying, highest demand jobs in Vermont. We like to share this with youth to introduce them to labor market information. Don't worry about reading this tiny print 
on your screen. Um, but this, oh, Lauren, I think it just shared the link so you can look at it on your own device at your leisure. If you share this with teens, you can let them know that it has occupations categorized by, this is done by Holland Code, which are specific characteristics and traits about a person. So do you like to observe, learn, analyze, and solve problems? Do you like to work with people and use your creativity? And there's another two categories. Do you like working with your hands or machines to make, fix, or build things? Or are you organized and detail-oriented? And do you like to work with lots of information? So those are the four categories the high pay, high demand jobs are listed in. And I'll just show you that the first column are the occupational titles. So when we were talking about 567 occupations in Vermont, um, these four categories contain the top 10% of those. Um, so there's close to 60, it's roughly 10%. There's about 60 occupations listed here. So these are examples of those occupational titles. Um, then there's projected openings over the next 10 years. So this simple brochure can help students not only see these promising occupations, but learn how to use labor market information. So if they're interested in a job that's not in this brochure, they can go um, to the Vermont Department of Labor's website and they can access all the exact same information on all 567 occupations. So important piece of that data is 10 year projections of openings. So if your teen is interested in an obscure occupation and there's only 10 openings projected over the next 10 years, that would be a clue that that's a really competitive field or maybe just an outdated or a field that's shrinking and, and not need it as much. Um, so that's something to really pay attention to look at, or it could be a unique, fascinating career that there's only a few people doing that in Vermont. That could be the flip side to that data. Um, but if your teen's looking for a growing occupation where there's a lot of openings, you can see that in these projections here. The third column here is minimum education and training required. And this is kind of interesting because in the last column, we have median wage hourly and yearly. And so it's not always correlated um, where in general, the more education and training you have, the more pay there will be. But every time we share this brochure with students, they point out all the discrepancies and say, wow, you only need a certificate to do a job that pays more than someone who needs um, a graduate degree. So they can kind of see this data for themselves. And this can be really helpful instead of just using generalizations about things to look at specific data. So this is something that can be helpful to look at and teach your teen how to use this data and, and learn how to use it yourself if you haven't. Um, so it's lots of information out there. And this is put in a format that hopefully is pretty youth friendly. Um, but having some adult guidance to go through it, we work with employers to show this to students when they're guest speakers in classrooms, we work with educators and school counselors. Um, so having a few adults who can help walk them through labor market information can really help as they're thinking about different options that they have. Okay, so now a few, um, these will be kind of our um, final parting comments of some noteworthy things that didn't necessarily fit in the other categories, but we wanted to make sure we shared tonight. And this is also um, partly a compilation of the advice that we had from some experts and students themselves. So I wanted to just take a moment to mention things that influence youth. I mean, these things influence all of us, but we're talking about teens today. So, and a lot of these influences have been around for a long time and some of them are newer and they're not in any particular order. So it's just something to keep in mind when students are thinking about what they wanna do after high school, there are so many factors and so many messages coming at them from so many different places. So this is more just something to, to keep in mind and be thinking about. So entertainment, 
TV shows, movies, music, all sorts of things like that. Um, developmentally, I gave that example to you at the beginning about elementary students doing like dress up in the classroom and having aspirations to really commonly known professions. Like everyone knows what a firefighter is. So an elementary student, that's just part of their awareness. Um, so a lot of times their career aspirations have to do with what they know. And then as students get older and they develop more, um, those influences change. And so a lot of times entertainment kicks in, um, even things like pro athletes and, and things like that. Social media, huge factor. And for today's generation, that's a lot of Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. It's maybe not the same social media we have. Um, we talk to students all the time about you'll want to set up a LinkedIn profile and put your resume there because that's really helpful in um, searching for jobs. That form of social media is so far from a youth's experience and interests and desires for being on social media. So um, their influences are coming from other types of social media that might not be the same as their parents or guardians or teachers. Peers, this one's been around forever. Lots of influences from peers. And family, not just parents and guardians, but it can be older siblings aspiring to do what an older sibling does or aspiring not to do what an older sibling does. Remember, there's positive and negative influences. Uncles and aunts, grandparents, um, there can be just through the form of, um, oops, sorry, family, I had that in the wrong order. Um, can be the influences can be through observing. So a teen can just observe what other people do for work, or they can have conversations like we talked about earlier, where they actually talk about what people do. And sometimes there are people who have occupations that youth don't really understand what they are unless they have a conversation about it. Um, but some might be really obvious. And then school also. Teachers, um, maybe guest speakers who come into the classroom, school counselors. Vermont high schools often have a work-based learning coordinator. Um, tech centers all have work-based learning coordinators. So they might have people who have information that are sharing that information with students about different jobs. And it could be in persuasive ways and it might be just in passive ways that the students are picking up and absorbing all of that. So just something to keep in mind, all those different influencers. And I like to actually share a list. You may have more adults to put on this list, but these this for me is a common list of adults who can help guide um, teens on their career search. So when you're thinking about your role as a parent or guardian, um, this is a little piece of personal advice for me, not really professional advice, but be open to your youth having all different adults um, helping them with their career search. Because sometimes, you might have the perfect information at the perfect time and you might know your teen better than anyone, but there might be some other adult in their life who might have the perfect information at the perfect time. So be open to that. Um, my daughter got a lot of her um, career path planning advice from a neighbor who she got together with and did lunch dates with. Um, and I love that, that she had another positive adult role model to talk about those things with. So parents and guardians, other family members and neighbors, um, classroom teachers, school counselors, work-based learning coordinators, coaches, sports coaches, um, mentoring youth group leaders like 4-H or other types of youth groups. And then I always put this one at the end. It's probably uncommon, um, but we like to let teens know that the Vermont Department of Labor has regional offices staffed with trained people that can help with career path planning, and they work with both youth and adults. So if your teen needs even more really specific information about careers. There's actually people who get paid to do that and it costs you nothing um, to be able to access that for your teen. So that could be a good thing to, you can just look up Vermont DOL Career Resource Center and you'll get a whole list of them. They are not doing in-person visits right now, but they're still doing virtual visits. Okay, so our very last piece of information are some pieces of advice we heard from experts over the last month when we asked them specifically about parents supporting their teen searches. So I compiled them here to share with you. Um, one is let your teen initiate the process. And that piece of advice actually came in the form of 
don't do everything for your teen for their career search. So really let them initiate some of it. They might need some encouragement from you, the right environment, the right tools, internet access, whatever it might be, but really help encourage them to initiate it themselves. Um, we heard that from both employers and college admissions counselors. Create opportunities for exploration and skill building. That could be activities you do as a family. Maybe there's a piece of exploration in there. And we talked earlier about special interests and hobbies with skill building. Um, be a sounding board. Listen and ask questions. The old adage that you have two ears and one mouth. So listen twice as much as you speak. That really comes into play with talking with your teen about their career interests. If the more you listen, um, the more helpful that can be to really give your teen a chance to be heard because um, they get their talk to all day and everywhere they go. Um, so it helps to listen. Travels and tools with your teen. I gave the example of the career interest survey. There's lots of other online tools and resources you can actually do as yourself too. That can be fun. Focus on their strengths, not just their weaknesses. Um, that is advice we heard over and over that that can help students with their aspirations and their career paths because a lot of careers are based on strengths more than they are on an individual's weaknesses and be a positive, positive role model. If your teen hears you saying positive things about work and careers, that can be really helpful um, to have them keep a positive outlook on their own. So thank you. Um, I think we finished right on time. Um, if I don't know if there were questions coming through in the chat and if Lauren was able to keep up with those, but if you have questions, we would be um, happy to follow up with you and answer them later. And Lauren shared that link of the info at careerscluck.org. You're welcome to email our staff and we can follow up with you.